Hey Dietrich Labs, Sam here. In this video I'm going to show you how to derive the Einstein field equations from the Einstein-Hilbert action. So this is the full Einstein-Hilbert action with the term for the cosmological constant and the term for the uh, source Lagrangian and this will give us the most general Einstein field equations. So just to clarify the only I guess somewhat unusual notation here is uh, this g, it's just the determinant of the um, covariant metric and that causes the Lagrangian density to transform under general coordinate transformations like a scalar density and that's necessary to make the action GL4 invariant so that's why that's there. <clears throat> okay so then the principle of least action gives us this which of course trivially just substituting in the action gives us this now what we can do, this commutes with, the, the, it's a functional variation, so it commutes with this uh, four, uh, four space-time integral. Now, so then we can pass it through as I've done here, but also we want to vary the action specifically with respect to the metric tensor, so we multiply and divide by the variation of uh, the metric <coughs> to make this a proper functional derivative with respect to the metric. Okay, so then uh, there's just a bunch of algebra steps here that are pretty straightforward that ultimately gets down to this and to go beyond this then we need some more non-trivial math so I'm going to briefly go through the algebra steps that I, that I took here to get to here but then ultimately um, I'm going to make that quick and then I'll focus a little bit more on the more non-trivial steps we have to go to move past this step here <coughs> Okay, so the first thing I did was I just multiplied this factor through. And the reason why is because I wanted to deal with these terms separately, the functional derivative of these terms separately. So then uh, uh, distributing that functional derivative through on these terms gives us this. Now we use the product rule to expand out the terms that are products. So this one isn't affected, but the other two are. The next thing I did over here uh, was I first multiplied everything by 2k so that the 2k ended up on this term here instead of on those. Uh, and the second thing that I did was I factored out a factor of root negative g. So then after that it proves convenient to write the square roots uh, as exponents so that we can use the chain rule conveniently to take these variations or at least take them partly. When you do that you get the action written in terms of only two variations, the variation of the scalar curvature with respect to the metric and then also the determinant of the covariant metric with respect to the contravariant metric. And this chain rule application gave us some minus signs and some factors of two in the denominator. And all of this so far was pretty straightforward algebra. Now in order to calculate these variations, that one and then these variations of the determinant of the metric, we need some more non-trivial identities. To calculate this one, we need uh, two special identities to figure all that out. The idea is to write the variation of the numerator in terms of something that involves a factor of the denominator so they cancel. We'll see how that ends up working. So <clears throat> To calculate the variation of the determinant of a matrix, we need to use something that I'm pretty sure is called the Jacobi identity, though I don't remember exactly. So if we want to differentiate the determinant of a matrix with respect to the components of that matrix, then the Jacobi identity tells us that it's the determinant of the matrix times the uh, transpose of the inverse. So then writing that with the covariant metric because that's the thing whose determinant we're varying. We get this. Okay, so then we just replace this with G because that's the notation we've defined. Then the transpose of the inverse of the metric, well first the inverse of the covariant metric is just the contravariant one. Then we flip the indices to get the transpose, but it's symmetric, so we don't actually really need to do that. We can just write the contravariant metric, it doesn't end up mattering. So then plugging that in gives us this result here. The first thing we need to do to get us a step closer to the result we're looking for is multiply it by the variation of the covariant metric, which gives us this. So now, uh, the thing we need to do is figure out what happens 
uh, figure out how we can get this in terms of the variation of the contravariant metric so that we can get a cancellation that's useful. So we need another identity in order to figure that out. The contravariant uh, metric and the covariant metric are matrix inverses. So the identity we end up needing is uh, <clears throat> the one for differentiating or taking variations, differential variations, differentials of inverse matrices. This is the answer, so the variation of a matrix in terms of the variation of its inverse is this. It's given by this formula. So now uh, it, it's useful then to take or to contract both sides with uh, a factor of the contravariant metric. This thing turns to Kronecker delta, which just ends up relabeling that index like that. Okay, so then now we're almost there. The only thing we need to do is contract the, the two remaining live indices on both sides of the equations. Then we get this relation. So again, the goal is to write this variation in terms of the variation of the contravariant metric, and we find that we can raise those indices and lower those ones if we simply stick a minus sign in there. So this gives us the identity we're looking for, which is that. Okay, so then written out in a box, we have this result. That's what we need. So then looking back at the variation as we left it, the variation of the Einstein-Hilbert action, we needed to calculate this variation in terms of something that contained a factor of the variation of the contravariant metric and no other variations just other numerical factors. And we've done that, so now substituting that identity in that we found right here, and then also there. Okay, so also I multiplied the two in there, and um, it appears, no, 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 I have not multiplied it by a minus sign. Okay, but anyway, uh, I've got a, uh, 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 I've stuck that identity in here and then multiplied that two across in that term. Okay, so then, now this thing, this, these are the terms uh, that are dependent on the source Lagrangian. None of the other ones are. So because this, these are the tensor terms that are dependent on the source Lagrangian, we'll call that the source tensor. And it just turns out to be the Hilbert stress energy tensor. So it's something that makes sense. It's what we would expect. Plugging that in, we can see that this thing, and simplifying, of course, so letting these factors, common factors in the numerator and denominator cancel like that, uh, and then substituting this identity in. First letting that cancel just gives this, and then substituting that identity in gives us something that almost looks like the Einstein field equations. We almost have it. The only thing that's different is we're missing the Ricci curvature tensor term, and we've got this here instead. So we can immediately see that somehow this is going to turn into the Ricci curvature tensor. But um, it's actually not altogether obvious how. In fact, we have to use a special identity that I already dedicated a whole separate video to deriving in order to do it called the Palatini identity. But before we even get to that, let's just write this in terms of the Ricci curvature tensor. Use the product rule. Let that term cancel because it's the same in numerator and denominator. We get the Ricci curvature tensor term that we were looking for and has the right sign and everything. So there's only one trouble. We've got this term. What the hell is that doing there? It turns out it zeroes because it's actually a total derivative, so it zeroes through Stokes' theorem, but um, we need to show that it actually is a total derivative. It turns out uh, that we can use the Palatini identity for the Ricci curvature tensor, which is this, and how this makes sense, where it comes from, how to derive it, how to prove it, all that stuff, is in a separate video, and there's a link in the description for it. Uh, it's, it's a video titled on my channel titled Deriving the Palatini Identity, uh, or proving the Palatini identity, I think. But ultimately what we can do is we can substitute that in, factor the metric in, meaning, uh, or distribute it in, factoring would be pulling it out, distributing it in, using the metronolic property to pull it in the covariant derivatives, and doing some index struggling ultimately gives us a very nifty result, this one. Now the interesting thing is that once you do the index struggling, then you can actually factor out this uh, covariant derivative, which allows you to write this whole thing in terms of uh, a four divergence, which is a total derivative, so it works. So then by Stokes' theorem, it vanishes, and we've got the Einstein field equations in here. So uh, because this should be general for whatever bounds you're putting on the integral, then this implies that, but this should be true for 
non-zero values of this, of these quantities here. So then we have finally the Einstein field equations, adding this to the other side, uh, and remembering that k equals 8 pi g over c to the fourth. Then we finally have the Einstein field equations from the Einstein-Hilbert action. That's how it works. It's a nifty calculation. It's very beautiful. It's sort of surprising. Uh, and it's actually not as complicated as you might think. Dietrich out.